name is Jack Crispin Kane. I am a member of Upper Lake Lodge Number 241, Independent Order of Oddfellows. I'm past District Deputy Grand Master of District 29, uh, past Grand, of course, uh, Grand Lodge Rep, uh, past Grand Chaplain 2018-2019, and I currently serve my lodge as Treasurer and Chaplain. Wow, that was, that's more titles than I'm going to say. I'm, I'm Brian Real, and I am a member of Garcia Lodge 240 in Point Arena, California. I am a past Grand Patriarch of the State of California and a past Grand Instructor twice for uh, the Grand Lodge of California. I'm, uh, you ready? I'm Pete Sellers, and I am a member of Yerba Buena Lodge number 15 in San Francisco and other entities in this order. I'm a past Grand Master, past Grand Patriarch, current Grand Representative, um, past Grand Instructor a few times, kind of did it all, Director Emeritus. So that's who I am, and I write books about this order. Awesome. Okay, and I'm TJ, hosting this, and uh, I'm a past Chief Patriarch, Mount Moriah, 38, a uh, member of Yuba Wendell Lodge, my home lodge, 15 in San Francisco, the greatest lodge in the world. I humbly say that to you. And uh, also uh, an associate of other lodges in, in the Bay Area, one in Mendocino which does not remain nameless. So let's go, guys. Well, I, I guess today's uh, uh, topic is about uh, Supreme Being and the ritual, how it's related to the ritual. Um, it's come about because there's certain legislation coming up in a couple weeks at Sovereign Grand Lodge, which could change the dynamic of our order or make it more enforceable where we, we're looking at uh, the possibility of members facing removal from the order should this uh, legislation pass. So what we want to look at today, what, what my understanding is, to look at the history of the order and, and where actually uh, Supreme Being came into our, our order and what it means today for some of our members. So that's kind of where we want to start. and, and um, that's what I have, and I can kind of lead into it, uh, my part of it as your grand representative. I can tell you that before going shifting over to Brian or, or Jack, but uh, I can tell you that uh, one of the things this current bill coming up uh, does, it affects members like me. Uh, when I joined this order, one of the requirements was believing in a supreme being, and of course, uh, it wasn't hard to do. You can find that anywhere, supreme being, whatever that belief may be. Uh, but over my three or four decades of being a member, I have come in and out of believing in a supreme being. There are times I do not believe in a supreme being. Uh, so what is a supreme being? Uh, you know, I can't define it, but I have heard it defined over the years. I've heard it defined as uh, even as far as being Jesus Christ, and which is a, a whole nother direction of what a supreme being can be. A supreme being could be uh, a different entity of what you believe in, uh, what created this universe. Uh, for me today, uh, one time in my life, uh, my parents were my supreme being, my creator, my universe. So that may not f fit the ideology of somebody who may want to say my supreme being was God. And uh, I don't always believe in God. Uh, terrible things have happened in my life where, where um, the way I justify believing in God, God isn't a good God. So are you good with that? If you're, if you're in favor of this legislation coming up, uh, are you going to keep me as a member because I don't believe in God being a good God. I don't believe God is my supreme being. Um, is, is that going to affect my membership? I think if I look at myself, I've served this order in many capacities, and to threaten removing me from this order uh, because I don't have the same belief in an 
in an entity that you may want me to believe in, uh, that that isn't justified to remove me from this order. But I'm one person, and we're talking about many. We're talking about the facing the removal of many members. And who knows, some members may leave just out of being offended that such a, a, a piece of legislation could pass. I'm for one, I'm not for it. I'm going to argue against it in the committee. And my vote will definitely be no for such legislation. We already have the standards in our codes that set the requirements for belonging to the order. Why make it more stringent, more strict? It doesn't make sense. It, it goes as far as saying removing atheist and agnostic. I mean, I can tell you, I, you could classify me as a deist or agnostic uh, in and out over the last 30 years of being a member in this order because I've lost that faith. Somebody wants to remove me from the order. Well, I, my statement to you is to get ready. So um, with that, uh, we can probably set up the history through uh, these two gentlemen uh, to my right. Um, I think that I want to start by quoting a little bit from the history of Odd Fellowship, uh, as it was this section anyways, written by the editor in chief, Henry Stinson, who, uh, was of course a past grand, uh, of Grand Lodge before they were called the Sovereign Grand Lodge. On page 28, the beginning of things, there is a section called the Primitive Theorem where Stinson gets at the origin of religion, he believes, and as an odd fellow believes, all, fellow, all odd fellows believe, the original habitat of ancient peoples was the imagery of a mountain rising and piercing the skies, a terraced mountain, and each stage dedicated to one of seven stars, that these stars in later days became identical with the stars of Ursa Major. I'm then going to skip ahead and let all of you know that to illustrate this, he claims that Chinese legend along with Egyptian, Greek, Phoenician were all derived from this symbol. Interestingly enough, before this is written, there is the ancient ritual of Odd Fellowship from 1797, which kind of shows that even before Stinson wrote about the investigation into early religion by him and other Masonic authors of his time. Page seven of the ancient ritual, the Grand Sire says, my emblem is the seven stars representing the constellation of Ursa Major. Uh, what we have is, is these early patriotic odd fellows trying very much to claim that all religions on the planet have one, one beginning. And in that, even here in California, funny that, you know, of course, Chinese were not allowed to join for a number of years. It was printed in our ritual as such, but that they would even at that exact same time, write in the official history that even the Chinese actually practice a belief system that would adhere to the tenets of odd fellowship. Now, they went on, of course, to say supreme being, and I believe that this is a, this is a connection that we, we need to understand in its fullest, and that is when the nation, our nation, before it existed and, and in the striving to become independent of Mother England, uh, these orders may, many of them, have already existed under various names, like, as just stated, the ancient ritual of Odd Fellowship, 1797, um, and before. And the reason why they would choose to not specify God has to do with the passages I just read. And it's, it also should be understood that in this, the Age of Enlightenment, there was an important transition that was being made from... Catholicism and the, the, the granting of 
Catholicism to the creation of kings that were then ordained or allowed to rule over nations of peoples. At that time, we were trying to move away from that. And so it was very important for the people who were helping to start our country as well as, as France and, and other countries trying to move into democracy from a, a more feudal time or in our case, colonies under a king. We chose supreme being and supreme being is really a very specific term that was popularized uh, during the French Revolution. And it's this is the reason why our forefathers chose supreme being as a requirement to believe in and not a god. This term comes from Maximilien Robespierre, who started the cult of the supreme being in 1794. The intention of this new belief system, church if you will, although they did not have physical churches necessarily. This was meant to be a practice done in your home, directly from you to your maker. Um, it was believed that without this, that man would be unable to, to have a nation, to, to actually be able to have the moral uh, characteristics with which to govern themselves instead of kings. So I think it's important to understand that the man who who created this term and this cult, which would then go on to be known as Theophilanthropy, that he himself was a deist and a Voltarian. And this is all very, very, very tied in to the reasons why our forefathers not only chose this, but then went on to help create this nation with the same principles as Odd Fellowship. So, when they do say supreme being, they purposefully do not say God. And I, and I think that this is incredibly important to this discussion today because some of the legislation, it sounds like it's, it's actually condemning deism as well. Um, and, it, you know, uh, also too, before I, I let Jack uh, uh, jump in, um, It does state uh, specifically uh, agnostic. So, you know, so it, it does deal with God uh, in, in indirectly. So you're right on the mark. So the supreme being isn't to mean God or Jesus Christ or, or something specific. You know, it can mean many, many different things. Uh, and that's how we admit our members. So you're right on. This, this, is, this is requiring our our applicants and our existing members to believe in God and some go as far as uh, I've heard it stated Jesus Christ and, and being a Christian and because a lot of our, our, our early organizations bought into the Christianity not that it's wrong it's just that's the way it was during that period in the 1800s so this the way this legislation is written it really takes us back 120 30 years it, it really takes us back and and in today we have evolved so far as an order and as a, as a society we're meshing now we're seeing things we're joining each other we're we're uh, breaking down a lot of stereotypes or we're trying we're working toward that for the order to even attempt to take us in this direction it's going to kill itself we're going to take a huge step back. I mean, this is a more restrictive piece of legislation. And, and anyone who knows 101 bills and legislation and bylaws, you don't make it more restrictive if you want to attract people. So you're right on the mark, Brian. Right on the mark. Yeah, the whole discussion has to look into the nature of being an inclusive organization. And the Vision Fraud Fellowship is an organization that encompasses the world. And all of us here today are merely a small part of that larger world. The larger world is composed, as we know, of so many different kinds of people and so many different points of view when it comes to religion and politics, that this is one of the reasons why we are 
essentially forbidden to debate religion and politics in the lodge. It is about friendship, love, and truth. And these are the watchwords of the order that we hold above all else. In my lodge, I know when we sit down for a meeting, when we sit down to dinner, we have different religious views, different political views, but because we have met for the higher purpose of Odd Fellowship, to build community together, these things are not an issue between us. It is essential that we look at the nature of the words universal brotherhood and universal justice. It is essential that we look to the needs of uh, our members and the community around us. And are we here to serve them or are they there to serve us? And I think we know the answer to that. We're, we're there to serve. The idea of excluding people at this juncture in time just seems very wrong to... Okay, I also think we should include a discussion about the nature of faith because I think it's really important to understand that the basic thing that many people who believe in God go through is doubt. And I think every human being has that because um, the very practical things that we see in our day-to-day -day lives don't always include a vision of God. Our bodies are limited in their scope and what they can perceive in the entire world and the entire universe around us. And um, uh, God is greater than us. God is bigger than us. And the mysteries that are encapsulated by the concept of God are beyond our comprehension. And this is why uh, people who engage in religion must rely on faith. And it's a difficult step. Not every human being is capable of this. And if Odd Fellowship is a part of someone's path and maybe they're moving towards God, it's a possibility, then um, they can see fine examples of uh, uh, decent and moral people. And this is essential to uh, building faith. And it can be a part of that. Odd Fellowship can be a part of building faith for people. Um, it doesn't have to be, but I can see how it could be. And I think it's really important that we not abandon those people who are going through doubts who uh, describe themselves as agnostic or athe athe atheistic, um, just as you were saying, Peter, that um, the nature of, of your view on God has changed. It, it could change for anybody, up or down, good or bad. But the fact is that if we keep ourselves together as an order, we'll continue to uh, enrich our communities. We will continue to bring um, the light of friendship, love, and truth, of faith, hope, and charity, of universal justice and universal brotherhood. This is what we bring to the world. Uh, these words are not just for members only. Uh, it's about uh, how people find odd fellows. I say to people that the best people I've ever met in my life so far have been odd fellows. And some of them have been the most kindest and gentlest people I've encountered. And I take those people as an example of how I can engage others. And this is so important to not let go of and to not be so narrow in our scope because the world is full of really fantastic people. It's not just a terrible place. It's um, it's really a beautiful place, and Odd Fellowship is a part of that beauty of the world. I have a question for all of you guys. Um, now, the Odd Fellows was born out of IRS code, also. So we're we're sorry. I have a question about about uh, Odd Fellows since it was born out of IRS code. We exist not as a religion, right? That's a five hundred one c three. We're a, a social order. We're a fraternal order, which means we have a completely different. We're not a religion, right? We have elements no, of it. 501c7, I think we are. And it oh, matters which fraternity yeah. you are. They yeah. each have their own code. It's a yeah. membership group, and we're not a religion. So how do, how do we rectify that with um, 
all these overtones that's historical, isn't it? Like when when was that introduced? Was it introduced at a certain time? The IRS code? Or no, not the IRS code, the um the changes in in the language. Oh, the changes in the language. Yeah. I can tell you I don't have the specific date, but they added chaplain in our lodge in the early ritual we didn't have the chaplain in the lodge room and uh, so they've added things over the years this is not the same order we had which which i thought would have been more fun back then <laughs> in the 1820s you know before they started these uh, ent these changes i think they occurred in 1827 were the first changes to the ritual and then in 1840s uh, when we broke away from Manchester unity or Manchester uh, we, we, we rewrote our, uh, our own rituals again so and then in the 1880s we saw some changes to, to the making it more religious probably sort of coincided with the temperance movement as it came into play the you know just I want to bring it back one second yeah, and sure. to answer your question. But what Jack said, um, we work really hard. And while I'm sitting here, all of us come here from different backgrounds. I mean, I can tell you my beliefs probably aren't there. You're, we don't share the same beliefs here with all five of us sitting here. We don't share the same beliefs. But we come together because we see the Alt Lodge as a venue to doing good works in our community. It's there. It's in place. It's such a great place. And we can give this order such a great name by doing the things we've done and what we do. We've really made this order shine in our own lodges. Our lodges are successful because of what we do for this order and in the name of this order. And we're diverse enough. Uh, I can tell you my backgrounds probably not none of our backgrounds are exactly the same uh, I can tell you the members I see in my lodge is extremely diverse as well we have members of all walks of life we have members of all beliefs uh, so if we're gonna narrow this down into uh, the supreme being being a very narrow type of belief uh, we're gonna hurt this order and none of us want to see this and based on what you said we don't talk politics or religious in the lodge during the meeting but out here we can talk about this this is how things are done this is how this piece of legislation was written uh, you know they had to write this you know that's religious as far as it gets uh, so uh, we are allowed to have open discussion on religion I wanted to point that out we can talk about that here uh, we're not in the lodge room. We're not in a meeting. We're not. That's how legislation gets proposed. That's how it gets presented. You have to talk about it. We are here. If this ever was implemented, we're here to make that change. We want to prevent this change coming. We want to prevent that big step back. So, uh, but again, uh, we work hard to find applicants. We work really hard. We have to get them processed. We have to get them their degrees. I mean, we have to get them their dues card. Then we have to send notices for dues. We have to list them on a, on a roster. We have to send it into the parent corporation. We get questioned about this. We're subject to audits. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we do in this all volunteer organization to make it more restrictive. I keep going back to that. To make it more restrictive is, is, is totally wrong. It's now, wrong. Now, they, this this uh, this change in legislation. What's interesting about it to me is if they do this, they're in, they're um, they're saying that the people who are already members now, that exist within the order, are they're not allowed to be in the order all of a sudden. We were we all had to adopt a non-discrimination clause not that long ago, right. and when this goes over, now here's the thing: some people have different feelings about the Lord's Prayer. I don't care. I, I have no problem with somebody expressing that that. In the lodge, doesn't bother me. Even if somebody else might be offended by it, I'm not actually, and I'm an atheist. Okay, but I think it's important that we have that tolerance in the space, right? That that's what we're doing when we're meeting together. We're we're showing that tolerance and love and uh, FL, you know, friendship, love, and truth, um, right? Uh, FLT. But the implications of that changing how nationally we become discriminatory, all of a sudden. We are an, a rogue entity because the United States government does not allow the nonprofits to discriminate. 
Next thing you know, within the laws of the land, we'll get sued. And there's not one lodge that can afford to get sued. And you're, you're right, because it, it, I could see because it's a private organization coming into the order. But if we're already existing members, and I've changed my belief, and, and, and I come and I happen to be in a period where I no longer believe I've had this I'd like to, maybe I can just read this so you can see the exact language of what they're proposing and I lose this belief you're gonna kick me out you're gonna try to hold a trial and kick me out I'm gonna sue you because I'm not going to be a member I'm gonna be allowed to sue you, you I love this order I wouldn't belong to it for decades if I didn't even like it. I wouldn't give up so much. I wouldn't have written so much about it. I wouldn't have delved into the history. I wouldn't have made friends with everybody just to be kicked out. Uh, are you kidding? I will sue you. I, I mean, you may want to edit that, but I don't know. Here, here it is. Uh, here's a proposal uh, being enacted. Let's see. Believe they want to add this. Uh, Belief in the existence. Believe in the existence of a supreme being who is a creator and preserver of the universe is an integral requirement to hold membership in this order. Atheism and agnosticism, both of which are a denial, disbelief, or inability to believe with certainty in the existence of a supreme being as previously mentioned, are both incompatible with membership in this order. That's ridiculous. Uh, we have people who, have, who are atheists. Uh, either they become that way or uh, they believe in other entities other than a supreme being now. This is who this will affect. Then this is the part where it affects the members. Loss of belief in the existence of a supreme being is sufficient cause for the suspension or expulsion of a member so so it's loss of belief how dare you the other interesting part about all of this is that um the moral precepts which govern us what what the ritual will say they come from the bible and that is to say that we, we <laughs> They happen to come from the Bible, and we have taken those precepts, and we have built what we call the Temple of Odd Fellowship, i.e., you could be anyone, as stated by Stillman, from all over the world, and as long as these moral precepts you follow, you will be practicing what they consider, uh, what Christians would consider Christianity. In fact, it is said in one of these books, maybe it's the Monitor and Guide, that uh, a member's first uh, real witnessing to uh, any action that is that is considered Christian, the first time they may see anything is in the benevolence of the members affording uh, a distraught member their benefits. And that's really what's important here is the fact that we are a sort of union that's meant to take care of one another and intentionally practice toleration. Again, another uh, piece of the Age of Enlightenment which is to say that we are not meant to care how other people worship or do not. Um, that we are to, and toleration, of course, is one of the encampment degree's main uh, lessons. The, referring back to what you said about religion, again, it, there was no chaplain. The reason why is that we were all members, third degree members of the priestly or scarlet degree, meaning of odd fellowship and although we have precepts that we claim are from the bible that we follow that make up that temple we are not priests of christianity we are priests of odd fellowship and in that we are meant to just simply relieve the distressed brethren that we have in the order that's it in fact when the chaplain was created the reason for it because of course the noble grand was the man who always gave prayer and lodge and by the way to the the thing about the lord's prayer i have a catholic member who feels that the usage of the lord's prayer in odd fellowship is actually uh, an offense to the church right you know he's a devout catholic but still a member but he's all why is that even in here but regardless the the idea is that we're practicing odd fellowship we are priests of odd fellowship 
And that is not the same thing as being a priest of Christianity. It just isn't. The, theoretically, these precepts could have been taken from a number of holy books, according to Grandmaster uh, Stinson, you know, who has told us that all of the faiths, you know, come from one origin, and that that is who Odd Fellowship you know, recognizes. More importantly, let me get this one more thing out. We're Odd Fellows. Why? Because we practice odd fellowship and what that means is that the other people in the order are unlike you that is why it is an odd fellowship right it's not that we're the same and if we eliminate everyone who is different from this order then what we are doing in giving examples of how christianity should be you know presented to the world according to these books we're going to be preaching to the choir so in an order that's been called the handmaiden of christianity why would you not want people who are following moral precepts, which we all agree are the bread and butter of the order, why would you not want new people to witness this? Why would you want no one else to know but people who already believe like you or really preaching to the choir? Yeah. That's what that is. I see, I see something really interesting that happens in one of the lessons, right? You have uh, the Good Samaritan for a second, right? So the anyone who knows about ancient history this the it's the people of sumer you know summer <laughs> it sounds like summer yeah. um and the Samar it's it's actually sumerian it's the good sumerian and he's a pagan he's we're talking about the people who believe in anunnaki which are aliens and that's what they they, they right. say now yeah. right so this is a very unconventional non-judeo-christian man who saves another guy's hide and by example right so and then that shows a, a, a degree of friendship so to speak right so you're talking about somebody who's behaving in a priestly manner. He spends his own money, saves a guy from robbers, clothes him, takes care of him, and they have a benevolent event there, but they are of enemy tribes. Exactly. So it's bringing yeah. people together, right? That's a fine example of what Odd you just said. Fellowship. Odd. And that, that's a really good example you brought up about Samaria, about the Samaritan. Yeah. Because uh, you don't want to tie, when we're doing conferring the degrees, it's a lesson we take. It's not the titles or backgrounds or religious aspects mm -hmm. of where this is, is coming from. It's a degree, it's a lesson of friendship. It's a lesson of truth, you know, it's a lesson of love. These are things we learn uh, in, our, in our degrees. It's not the history of, the, of, of, of Jonathan and David and Goliath, it's not the, it's not those histories, and that's where people are losing. They're thinking we're, we're because these lessons come from the Bible, they're thinking that we're a religious entity. It's not that at all. It's just that these were the finest examples probably at that time, but they probably could have found good examples for conferring those degrees and other religious aspects. But at that time, you know, Christianity was growing. It was strong in America. And what Brian said about the Catholic who may not uh, think that the Lord's Prayer should be in the order, the, the clergy did, as I, we were talking before this started, in James Ridgely's book, who is probably, that's the foremost history book about American Odd Fellowship. In James Ridgely's book, he talks about the clergy clashing with the order. In, in 1819, as early, you know, that's the first year we started, 1820. They started the, uh, the funeral processions, the funerals uh, for their members in Baltimore. And they used to start those at 10 p.m. at night. And the procession would walk one mile, march one mile under ca candlelight, following the hearse, uh, you know, the horse-drawn hearse, to the cemetery, start the service at midnight. And they would perform the rites. The odd fellows, they would say those words over the grave. The clergy was so upset. It took years to work that out for the odd fellows. They, hey, we're going to do it. We don't care what you say. We're going to do it. So, you know, the clash, they, they put religious ideology out to the side. So, and that was the emphasis here. Now we're coming back to that 202 uh, years later. That's why I'm asking about legal context because I'm a reverend also, which is sounds whoa, hold, what? I'm legally allowed to perform a wedding if I want to, right? 
So, um, and the state gives that, or the the, uh, the federal government gives that allowance as well. So, um, as an order that's a club, a social club, not a religion. That's why looking at the examples of the root of the lesson instead of what's actually being taught, because it's not Christian, it's actually pagan and, and Judeo people coming together over this one man's demise on the road. You well, know? A- according to Grandmaster Stinson as well. Yeah. According to a lot of uh, historians. and, and there's, also, uh, there's also a few things, too, about, about us using the Bible, actually, as a sort of protective cloak for what the order may or may not have been up to at different times. Um, and this, of course, delves into politics. Jack, uh, the, yeah. the, the formation of the order as we claim it today um, has a little bit to do with this, and I, I'd like to talk more about it, but maybe you could, I mean, sure. talk about that. Sure, so often in England, you'll see a date of 1717 pointed to, and I saw that with the Masons as well. And I looked into what was happening in England in 1717. Well, during that time or close to it, uh, the uh, House of Hanover took, took the throne in England. So we had a German king. And King George I was very concerned about the various organizations in England. And uh, he wanted to consolidate power. He wanted to alleviate his fear and so he uh, demanded that all the various lodges apply for a charter, exhibit their patriotism and their faith, because he draws his power from the divine right of kings. So although there were Masons and Odd Fellows as an organization, as lodges in England prior to 1717, this is when they were officially chartered by the crown. And so the tradition of patriotism and even the tradition of uh, of faith is uh, you know has its roots then and it was a you know tumultuous time for some in England at the time and you know King George uh, the first was very what we would call very paranoid and he was a little crazy and so he saw to it that uh, everybody towed the line and that's what that was about. And he was right that by King George the Third, sure enough, we would help to create a nation yep. out of what was once English colonies. Yep. And and I will bet you that that is a lot of reason why we waited till 1819, because we were still afraid that there were still Masons who were Tories, and Odd Fellows who were Tories, and we had to make sure we weren't going to be reinvaded. Now, if you go further down the line into Victorian America you'll find that uh, the order is used again in a different, completely different manner, but again in order to bring about change in a political sphere. And really what I'm talking about is the creation of the female auxiliaries, namely the the Rebecca's. And Schuler created the Rebecca's and, and there are traditionalists who claim that they were cheated of, of a ritual that is unlike ours and, and is a subservient thing and blah, blah, blah. But I think what everyone is forgetting is the reason for the Rebecca's existence was to help women get the right to vote. And the reason why th- this is a thing is that women at the time, having no right to vote, needed to prove to everybody that they could govern a body. We, we are recognized as a sovereign peoples living in many nations. So if you could have a group of women run a governing council in the same way as the United States would or England or whatever, then there you have it. They are equal. They can do the exact same thing as men. Now, this happens again later on. But, but then we're talking about uh, the people unionizing. There's a film um, that is a, a horrible propaganda piece. Um, it's the guy who did Birth of a Nation, and it's a, it has some really bigoted things about Oddfellows in it. Yeah, what what is his name? Birth of a Nation. Uh, D.W. D.W. Griffith. Griffith. Yeah. D.W. Griffith was uh, not only a member of the KKK, but he also was a propagandist, 
uh, a friend of Edison and an early one of the earliest filmmakers. And he was, I believe, paid at some point to create The Violinist. And this is a silent film about a young man who uh, is a foreigner. He's new to America. Uh, he appears to be maybe a gypsy, and he is an excellent uh, fiddle player. And he is hired by a local industrialist to teach his daughter how to play the violin. And of course, these two young people spending so much time together find that they are fond for one another. Now, at this same time, the friends of the, the main character, the violinist, he has joined a union recently. And when he goes to the union meeting, all of them, I kid you not, are dressed in Odd Fellows regalia. Specifically that worn in the initiatory degree with the skull and bones and whatnot. In these scenes, they are shown uh, saying things like, all high and low shall be one. And essentially what this propaganda piece is, ends up being about is an anti-socialist one okay and of course what happens is that the supposed evil odd fellows who are also pictured as being uh supporters of temperance because they do have a temperance woman in there um that these these men decide that they are going to plant a bomb in that industrialist house and of course our hero draws straws and he is one of the two members of the odd fellows to go into the basement of this man's house to plant a bomb literally a terrorist action this man is accusing our order of number one organizing a terror operation amongst immigrants whose only real struggle is that they are poor and are under the foot of the company store and the industrialists. Of course, the film being a propaganda piece ends with our hero getting rid of the bomb, taking out his brother Oddfellow, and as a treat at the end, happy ending, he gets to marry the industrialist daughter. Don't forget also, um, in, that, in that film, what's interesting to me that I saw that was really, really bizarro, was they use a tiny girl, a girl in a, in a Victorian woman's outfit, like she's a suffragette, yep. to, to, to uh, make her diminutive, right? And, and it looks like it could be Emma Goldman or somebody, right? Yeah. Um, and so they, use, they put her up on top of this table. They put her up on top of this table, and they all bow to her at some point. You guys need a break? No. Okay. No, I, I, I want to finish this okay, you can, thought. You I, can, was, I was bringing up one of Griffith's films, Intolerance. Oh, so yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's so, great filmography. So, so if so you know me, about the suffragette, right? Yeah. Let, let me just jump back yeah, yeah. in here and say that, that at that time, uh, this anti-socialist uh, movement that's happening in the U.S., we were kept from it basically because of our belief in a supreme being. All right? If we had not had that, the religious trappings that we do or do not treat correctly, right, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, we practice I I idolatry, right? Um, the, the, the bigger point is, is that the order has been used for different things, political motives, and would happen again and again. And so we've actually kind of used the Bible as a shield, you know, to keep us in the ability to unionize, to give women the right to vote. And, uh, and really, I'm actually kind of surprised if it wasn't for the, the Supreme Being, I'll bet you McCarthy would have considered us a communist organization. To, to make a, a point of here is that there's another section that happens, something in the film that happens twice. They sign something, but before they sign it, they, they, cut, they tap blood out of the wrist and then they sign an agreement. Mm. Now, in, in scriptural terms, if you were a, a born-again a born Christian or a uh, reformist Christian or a uh, Protestant of sorts, right? T several things you don't do, you don't use any idols or any images, which all Oddfellows odd temples have. Yeah. Catholics have a problem with that. The other thing is that you can't make an oath to anyone. You don't swear to anyone, right? And so that right there is saying, okay, they're communists, the odd fellows are communists. They're also taking a blood oath by doing the thing with the arm, yep. and they have idolatry with all the symbols, right? Yes. So if you're actually a practicing uh, Orthodox Christian, you might think of the odd fellows as one hee haw of a story, well, and you wouldn't want to join them because they're they sound a little too weird. They're very in, odd. Yeah, and in the earliest uh, usages of 
atheist. Um, it was commonly used by Orthodox religions to describe any other religion. Um, nowadays, we use it for just someone who's you know doesn't believe in a god, but uh, its roots are actually in priests calling out other religions as as you know you guys are going to hell, which is you know ridiculous. And that's what we do in our fellow. encampment degrees, you know, before we reach the toleration, you know, especially in the golden rule degree. Yeah, I, I we do. We kind of chastise everybody else, and, and <laughs> that, that even goes to religions and beliefs and pagans and and uh you know uh, all, all those all those things they they have and and but but by the end yeah they're all odd they're fellows. all together they're, they're all, all lined up in a line and yeah I can't think of anything else for it. And again, I can't emphasize enough what a step backward that would be for this order. We have done so much work as we touched upon to grow this order, to bring members in, to be diversified. And uh, we've dealt with a lot. We've dealt with prejudices and uh, bigotry, uh, racism, and to, to now uh, emphasize on religious aspects it just it just really takes us back and and uh, i i can just s sum this up for myself and for all of you that that um it's wrong and uh again i'm i'm against this new legislation and i'm glad we had this discussion and i want to thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of it i got i was able to share some of my my own feelings uh, some of my feelings based on facts um, and uh, you know you don't know what people are dealing with and, and uh, they could fall out of grace they could fall out of non-belief of a supreme being and and I've admitted to that uh, you can almost call me an agnostic if you want to put a title to it you know or a deist or something along those lines because I fall in and out of that and I go right, I go left, I go straight. It just all depends what happens in my life. And so, again, thank you for letting me express myself. And I, I, I have something to say. I, I've, I've heard before in closing that they're talking about getting rid of the encampment branch. And I have to wonder if the people who have put forward or are putting forward this legislation have ever taken the encampment degrees. And if they have not, maybe the lesson of toleration needs to be taught to them. Um, my fear is that the reasoning for getting rid of the encampments, which of course I'm a past grand patriarch like yourself, is actually to allow this kind of thing to happen to the order. And it is not something that I believe uh, is either good for it or for spreading fraternity across the world, as we are told, as odd fellows, we are supposed to do. But I, I would hope that uh, that these gentlemen or sisters, these representatives, go out of their way and, and reread the encampment rituals and uh, delve into the actual, as we have today, origins of the term supreme being and what it means to our country as well as to our fraternity and our freedoms. And thank you for having me. Oh. Non-discrimination policy. What it believe? Right. What you, right. So now you could say those things you wanted to say. Okay. No, he knows. Um, but From it's in speaking to the non-discrimination policy, I've heard the word toleration. And it still means that we might have a problem with it. And in fact, what I'd like to see is a joyful embracing of diversity. This is what we need to do. This is what non-discrimination can be about. And it's very important that we uh, embrace all of God's creatures. It's not for us to judge. If we are Christians, then we're taught that uh, God does the judging. 
and the process by which people go through in their lives with um, their relationship with God. It's a very, very personal thing. And it's not something that we are dragging into Lodge. It's not something that we're making an issue between us. This is something that we need to allow individuals to work out amongst themselves. And it's very important that we allow people to have their process and support them in their process and do that by being good odd fellows, by upholding friendship, love, and truth. <laughs> and thanks for letting me be a part of this. Thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you to all three of you guys for joining us. In this. this is outside of St. Peter's Chapel and on the West Coast in California on Mare Island, which is a former military base for many years, employed about 45,000 people here. Uh, we're also the home of the Zodiac Killer. Uh, and uh, and St. Peter's Chapel has, if you ever visit us, has the largest collection of Tiffany uh, glass Tiffany in glass. it on the West Coast. So it's really beautiful. I'm not even sure people ever have church here anymore, but they do get married here. And uh, I'm, I'm non-religious, but I love the Oddfellows. I'm really happy you guys joined this conversation.